Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we have on a special guest, Adrian Venegas from Colombia. Adrian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeffrey. Glad to be on. Now, Adrian, you have a, a lot of time in Scientology, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, yes. You, but where I want to start, because you're from Colombia, the... Yes. Um, there's a controversy going on in Colombia, and here in the U.S. we're covering it very, a lot of interest, as in Europe. David Miscavige received a medal from a retired Colombian police general, General Mino Bravo. That's right. Now, what, that blew up in Colombia. What's going on? Can you give our listeners uh, an update? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried to pay too much attention to it, but it has been just inevitable. I've seen it on... Um, uh, the newspaper websites. That's how it got to me. Uh, I first I first saw it on on um, one of the comedians here, who is a journalist at the same time, and he you know he makes funny stuff. He was the, one, the first one who brought it up, and I saw it on, uh, just by following him on Facebook. Then he was he was talking about like funny things that had, that had just happened recently, and one was uh, somebody was congratulating putting a medal on a robot in one of the cities here. And another one, um, the uh, president said that he had had help from a witch to get one of the gorilla, gorilla heads, and then that one of the retired generals had consecrated David Miscavige. <laughs> and what, what was uh, what was funny to me is is uh, David Miscavige took the free ones to Barbados. The ceremony didn't yeah. even take place in Cartagena. No, it didn't. So did that give you the feeling in, that it was very sneaky? At first, I thought I, it had happened in Cartagena. I didn't know it, it happened in Barbados. I, I only read it uh, afterwards. Yeah, it did. They it, When the thing blew up, yeah. Well, you know, this uh, on the free ones, the ship, did, were you ever on the ship? Never, luckily. Oh, yeah, I've heard it's hell being on the ship. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> because, because David Miscavige can order the ship wherever he wanted, uh, my my cousin was there for 26 years. Really? Yeah. Wow, he's on the ship for 26 years. That's gonna yeah, be... she just quit. Really? Yeah. That is. Uh, I'd love to talk to her because yeah, she won't. Uh, she's still in. I understand, but I'm just saying yeah. that aside from Captain Mike Napier and a few other people, nobody lasts on the ship that long. Yeah, she joined just a little before I joined staff. Okay, well, that takes us back to you. You joined uh, Scientology in what year? January 1991. And how old were you? I was 17. Did you get interested because of uh, Dianetics? Or, uh, uh, I had just uh, left school and um, they gave me the study tech technology, the study tech uh, course. I liked it. Boom, they got me. Wow, what, what city were you in? Bogota, right here. So you're right, right. That's the, were, were you born in Bogota? That's where I was born. It's a beautiful city. And yeah, so, it's it's real nice, nice weather. Yeah, what well, you're 17 years old. You're mm -hmm. now, 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 now at that time in Colombia, there was Pablo Escobar. Oh yeah, was the full big, on big drug lord. Yeah, and uh, he set off a bomb real close to the org. He did. He set up a bomb close to the org. Yeah, I was in the org when one day um, there was glass ceiling and he shook. It was loud. I came out and there was the uh, smoke cloud. Boom, right there. Were people killed? It was so loud. Unfortunately, yeah. Oh, Lots. I'm sorry to hear that. But you're so you're in you're in that part of Colombia where there's a wave of, of narcotics terror fr from the drug dealer. Um, mm hmm. And you're in you're in Scientology, so it's a dangerous environment to be in at that time. It certainly was. Uh, Where you, I mean, you, you had to maintain a lot of situational awareness. Uh, I would imagine. How was Scientology viewed at that time in Colombia? Was it a non-factor, or or did you keep completely it? unknown? Completely unknown. It's just been like since the Tom Cruise thing, and then the new building here. It was unknown before. Now it's now. Um, Colombia is predominantly Roman Catholic. Did you grow yeah. up? In, you grew up in as a Roman Catholic. Correct. 
And so what did your parents think when you, this Scientology, how did you explain it to to your fellow Catholics? I didn't have to. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't seen as a, as a religious practice before. Oh, I see. So it's like self-improvement. Yeah, that's exactly how it was looked at. And nobody would have a problem with a young man like you wanting to improve himself. Not at all. Oh, that's very good. You know, it's interesting, uh, just switching topics for a minute, and I want to ask you about this, Adrian. Uh, I did a recent uh, article, guest article at Tony Ortega's blog, and I mm-hmm. discovered that Dianetics had a mission right next to the to the house where Pablo Escobar was, was killed. I saw the report, yeah, that was funny. By search block. Now, that's in Medellin. Yeah. And... Uh, what struck me, and this is a question I want to ask you, would Dianetics have a problem being in Medellin, or why did they pick right next to the house where Pablo Escobar was killed by search block in 1993? Um, I don't think I don't think that place was set back then. I don't know. I'm not so sure because the uh, Google photo was recently taken, so that leads me to believe it was just in the past couple of years. It was few years. Yeah, it was in the past few years. Yeah. Well, here, well, here's what happened. I want to bounce this off for you to get your thoughts. I was studying uh, Scientology in Colombia, right. looking looking at the Bogota uh, Ideal Org, which is a big, beautiful building. Mm-hmm. I saw that they had a, a, a Dianetics mission in uh, Medellin, and I and I seem to remember because I studied the Pablo Escobar story. You know. When that terror was going on, it came to the United States. Pablo yep. Escobar's cartel, the, the Medellin cartel, was here in the United States blowing up things, killing people in Miami and Florida. Mm-hmm. And That's when, how it happened, yeah. Well, I've got to tell you, it was ter- a terrifying drug lord. When it when it comes to your country, it's not abstract, and you're living it every day. So I actually got on to, uh, uh, I found a video of a tourist who was filming the Pablo Escobar death house and he panned the camera over and I saw Casa Hubbard. And I saw the it. video. But you know I what saw happened? the video. You know what has happened? Is yeah. that that video, after I published the article on Tony Ortega's blog, that video is gone. I believe the, oh, the really? Church, yes, I believe the Church of Scientology got that video taken down. In fact, the entire account, which was an old account where this video was, the whole entire account was taken down. Wow. Now, in your opinion, just your opinion, why would Scientology act to destroy that account and get rid of the video? Is it too incriminating? I guess it is. I mean, we know the leader, that's what he does. He listens to Tony. He listens to you. He, he pays close attention to, to uh, people who are really doing something about it, like yourself. Well, would it be considered out PR Bad PR for the church? Absolutely. Absolutely. What would the people in Colombia think about Dianetics being next to that house? It's just a funny fact. It, it really doesn't matter much, I don't think. But the church... It's a, place, it's a place people would like to visit, you know, because that's where he, that's where he was killed. Sure. I mean, I would have. You know, oh. if I had the chance to go and visit, I would go and visit the place and just, you know, just for shits and giggles, but... Then to see the place decorated with the little triangle, yeah, that's just a funny thing. Yeah, and so the church would just want to get rid of the video, hide the evidence. Which, Might have paid the guy. I don't know. Who knows what what they did? Yeah, it's just a, it's just a curious point that Scientology. When you see a video go down, like there's a, a video that Scientology uh, got taken down, and it was of David Miscavige talking in 1999. And he's saying no matter what happens, no matter if some madman pushes a button, the t- technology of dynamics and Scientology will always be here. And it's a very overblown, exaggerated video. And they take that video down. And so they, they do watch and they do engage in censorship. So it's just, a, it's just an interesting thing that they do not want to be associated with the Pablo Escobar in any way. Wow. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm... I'm that's why I was asking you, but it... But it certainly doesn't surprise me. No, nothing surprises me. So... No. Go, go as on. you always say, and as Margaret always says, uh, 
Scientology is always the worst than you think it is. <laughs> it is always worse. Now, going back to 1991, you right after you got into uh, Scientology at age 17, you signed a two-and-a-half-year staff contract? Yep. And you were working at the Bogota Org? Yeah, that's right. Now, this wasn't the new building that David no. was open. No. No, it was a little house. It was a house? Yeah. Really? It was a house. A nice, nice area, but... It was a, just a house. Oh, that's interesting. And then you, so what did you do on staff there in Bogota? I worked as the DIRCOM, Director of Communications. Oh, man. What a waste of time. <laughs> was there nobody to communicate with? or? The thing is that they, they overblow it and, and, and they make you believe. I was so young and naive. I, I st still am. But they told, they told me, you know, like, if you're part of the HCO, you're so much better than everybody else. I bought it. <laughs> and you signed for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what's interesting is they'll give you great titles in Scientology. That's what they do. I mean, they you're love bomb you. You're 17 and you're a director. Wow. Director. Who's so up? big. I even had to put a little sign on the on the door that like nobody can come into the HCO space. Now, can wow. you for for our new time Scientology listeners? Please explain what the HCO is. This is important, and I want our new Scientology watchers to, to learn. What is the HCO? The Harvard Communications Office is the most important division in the uh, seven uh, division or board. If you're part of that division, you are better. You're better qualified than the rest of the, uh, of the crew, the staff. Yeah, and that's important that the HCO or the Harvard Communications Office is an important authority within the Church of Scientology International. Mm -hmm. So if you were summoned to come and see the HCO, that's not a good thing. Definitely not, unless but, you're going to be posted there. Now, is the ethics department in, in the HCO? The third division, that's right. The third department, sorry. So when you get a sec check in ethics, the HCO summons you, correct? Mm-hmm. So that's right. They call you there. So They're always checking on your making sure you're there on time, that you're, you know, towing the line. So the, the HCO really is the, the Scientology enforcers. That is correct. Yeah. So your HCO, now you finish your, what's interesting is you finish your tuning, your, your staff contract is the director yeah. of communications, and then you join a, a WISE group. That's what I did. I met this guy. His name was Mike Edwards. He came to Bogota. And, you know, he was, he was American. I was like starstruck. Oh man, he's a gringo. And, uh, he was charismatic. He was funny. He, he started to teach me some English at the time. And after I left, I joined him and, uh, he had a practice and he became somewhat successful because he, he, he had help from this other American guy from who was actually living in Venezuela. He came over to Colombia. He moved here. And he was good. He was a good salesman. He was a good speaker. And he sold uh, seminars, uh, so to speak. And we made, good, we made good money. And then this guy, Mike, the one I just brought up before, yeah. he, he decided to use the profit the other guy was making to start helping the military. So that was the first time um, the military was reached by Scientology. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I wanted to get into. Now, ju just by way of filling in some blanks for our listeners, WISE, right. is, WISE is an acronym for the World Institute of International Science. Institute yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. The, it, World Institute of Scientology Enterprises. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, now, it's a business consulting group. Supposedly, yeah. Yeah, supposedly. What's well, actually a, a, a front group for the Church of Scientology to recruit. Just like everything else. Yeah, they recruit business people in through, they sell business consulting. They use the Hubbard business management. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, they re, they go after dentists, veterinarians, yeah. chiropractors, yeah. small businesses. And, and they sort of consult. And these, these wise business people are... Uh, are contractors and they pay the church of 10% of, and then other fees and then they get non-Scientologists in and you, then these businessmen find out the real purpose is to 
join the Church of Scientology to get the real stuff? Only at the time there was no internet, nobody knew about it, so just people just didn't pay much attention to it or didn't know what was going really going on. But they did try to disseminate like the uh, uh, owners or uh, CEOs or you know the most prominent people at those companies, but that wasn't successful. Now you see, Mike Edwards, he he was an OT three. He he died in two thousand nine, I believe. Oh, you know about him? Good, yeah. He was a funny guy, yeah. A, a, a character. Yeah. Now he so he begins he begins working uh, with the uh, Colombian police and military. How does that go? How how does he approach them? Easy, easy. He just let me see if I can recall what he did. But it was really easy. Okay, so this is how it happened. There is a guy, uh, one of the opinion leaders here uh, with Scientology, who is a really, really rich guy. His name is en Enrique Garces. He, he's part of a very powerful family. Not the most powerful, but certainly powerful. His uncle, um, I can't recall his name. Jesus. No, that's okay. He was audited personally by Ron. Oh, by somewhere Ron. I think in by Yellow Rage, yeah. Yeah. So he hmm. was a Scientology, so he, he 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 made some people join in the family. And this guy, Enrique, he was friends with Mike. You know, they would get together and you know, just talk and chit chat and whatever. And he asked for his help to reach into the military, and that's what they did. So he got an appointment, he went there, he got contacts and he ended up meeting a general. Uh, he was in charge of the recruitment division. And from that recruitment division, uh, we started working with the military for about two years intensely. So we had to go around the country, the bases, the military bases, and deliver the ARC seminar, the tone skill seminar, the uh, leadership seminar. It was fun. It was fun. I, I got to travel for the first time when, when I was a young kid. And what was the appeal to the to the military? Was it that the uh... oh, they loved it. They loved yeah. it. They gave us they gave us tickets. They gave us they gave us hotels. They gave us rides. We got to go to the uh, 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 our Pentagon here in, in, in Bogota, so to speak. Uh, we had access. We we got to hang out with uh, ministers a little bit, but it was fun. Oh, I could imagine, especially for for a young man. Now, but it was for free. We did it for free. That's what appealed to the military. We we they didn't have to spend. Anything they didn't have to manage any, any budget other than than the tickets or the hotels. So really, were you teaching them like the org board administrative they, technique? Just the ARC, you know, teaching them what affinity was, you know, doing a couple of drills, what reality was, doing a couple of drills. Um, the tone scale, how to manage the tone scale, how to be above uh, 0.5 above the tone scale to raise uh, the other guy and make him, you know, more able or take him to a level where you can sell them or help them out and that kind of stuff you know i want to give you some history you you may not know but i'm looking at uh ability magazine i'm sorry uh scientology magazine from 1954. Mm -hmm. this is published by the hubbard association of scientologists phoenix arizona issue 29g for those who, who like details like me now back in 1954 there was a colombian named uh, Frederico Echevarria. That's the guy. That's yeah. the guy. That's the guy that was audited by by Howard. By Howard. Yeah. yeah. There's a picture of him, of Senor Echevarria, sitting at uh, the advanced clinical course in Phoenix. There you go. Fifty four. Now he he sort of opens the door to Scientology in Colombia, and the Echevarria family's wealthy. They go back. Really long. wealthy. Well, they they there's a company called Organization Corona. That's right. Founded in 1881, they're into textiles and all kinds of business. Yeah, they sell basically what what you want in your bathroom, like toilets or or or, or uh, sinks. But they actually uh, made it a bigger deal, and they created like what what you would call in the states a, a Home Depot. We call it here a home cent center, and they, they it's just as big as Home Depot. Wow. Yeah. So that so they're a big they're a big presence. The Echeverria family. Absolutely. And, they're they're into Scientology, uh, so you're you get to meet some of the leading families, mm -hmm. and you're in the military. I mean, this is mm -hmm. a this is a big deal for a, a young man. 
Mm-hmm. And, and yet, there's a dark side to it. I didn't know. <laughs> well, no, you wouldn't know, but then... You us, never know. Well, that's the thing. See, Scientology from the outside can look very fashionable. It has movie stars. We're helping. We're the most ethical group in the world. We well, got the, you... the tech to free people, really. We know what happens after you're dead. That's impressive. I mean, if you know. Oh, man, you know it all. Well, did people ask you about Tom Cruise and John Travolta? No, they don't. I don't talk about it. So I try to Mm. avoid the topic because it's embarrassing. Okay. I'm just saying back, back, (laughs) back back in the 90s when you were. Well, okay, okay, okay. So back in the 90s, in the 90s, I didn't know Tom Cruise was a Scientologist. I knew uh, Travolta was. He was in one of the events when he got the medal. But. About TC, it was only a rumor, only until oh. I saw the video, you know, with the uh, black turtleneck uh, oh, video yeah. where he goes like, KSW, KSW, KSW. <laughs> yeah. That's the only time I actually, you know, uh, confirmed that he was, uh, in fact, a Scientologist. I, I, I didn't really know. It was speculation at the time. It wasn't known. No. And, uh, that's interesting to know because he was here in the U.S. We knew we knew earlier that he was. Yes, and I and I and I read the story on how he was found out about when somebody spilled the beans from from Ain't and they were punished and stuff. Yeah. You know what happened? Wh- no, Mike Mike Edwards, the late Mike Edwards, mm-hmm. uh, he gets involved. It's discovered that he's molesting children. How did you find out? Well, it got it got leaked onto the internet. Oh my God! I haven't read that. You know. It was leaked onto the internet. And, I thought I was uh, the only one who knew. <laughs> well, the internet is big, and here, here's what here's what how it works. Of course, is people who are in Scientology know the secrets. Yeah, and, but and, I didn't know that anybody talked about this guy. Uh, no, you can you can find information out here, and and when people leave the church, they talk. Look, the church, the church, the church is so good at hiding all the dirt. Absolutely. Threatening people into silence. Yeah. Threatening to break up their families, disconnect them, ruin their business. So that if you ever talk about the bad stuff that really goes on. Look, here in the United States, it's very well known that the Church of Scientology has covered up rape, sexual abuse, child molestation. Experts. Yeah. And it's very well known. It's documented. The victims have spoken Mm -hmm. out. The, mm-hmm. church, the church has a legions of attorneys to fight this. They are the best at hiding this stuff, yeah. Currently, uh, an actor named Danny Masterson, who's a Scientologist, oh, yeah. is, is, love being, this is being investigated. So mm-hmm. you you actually experienced this. What, what was the sequence of events and what happened to Mike Edwards when it was discovered? Ah, let's see if I can if I can, if I can make a real show. When he sh- when he showed up at the organ, I was on staff. This is ninety two. Um, he got a few of the young kids to go to go along with him. I was included, but he didn't molest me. Thank God. But he did get another kid, and he moved in with him. He moved mm-hmm. in with him. He got an mm-hmm. apartment, and he brought in this kid. It sounded like he was adopting him, and his parents were okay with that. He he had he had a mother. Um, and he also had a brother who later joined, but then every time he came to the States, he went back to the States, he would bring him clothes and, and, and shoes and stuff. And he would be, the, the kid would be, uh, ever more demanding every time, uh, he, he, he wanted this, he wanted that. And, you know, getting a pair of Levi jeans, uh, jeans, he wasn't so easy back in the day. So the kid, you know, he was, m- m- uh, made to feel special because he was getting all these things. Little did I know he was being raped. Oh my God. Okay. So this is 93. I joined the group, uh, about a year later and then we worked until 96. This was with the wise consulting group. Correct. Mike Edwards at the time started like disseminating, uh, quote unquote, and he got the, uh, first, um, what do you call it? Uh, super, not, not superpower, uh, power FSM medal. Pin. It was a medal. A medal. It was just a little trophy thingy. Yeah. Now, FSM, FSM, what does that term mean, please? 
Field staff, uh, what field staff member? I, I'm yeah. starting to forget. Yeah. Yeah, field staff, field staff member. Field if staff you, member. If you work, and for he, some, he su yeah. supposedly, if you if you if you um, disseminate the whole thing to a hundred people, you get a medal or a pin. This is the power of the same thing. So what he did is he false, falsely reported that he was disseminating disseminating directly to Miscavige. At the time, he was easy access for the guy. I think I saw him texting or emailing back and forth, and he got the pin. Then uh, about a year later, he 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 had a he had another pin for disseminating to a thousand people. I think, I'm not quite yeah. sure. But yeah. then later, he and his partner, the guy from Venezuela, he got the they got the award for ten thousand uh, people uh, <laughs> onto the bridge. This was called Elite FSM. <laughs> ten thousand people on the 10, bridge. Ten thousand people on the bridge. <laughs> they, I think, I I'm not sure, but I think they repeated the award the year after. I'm not I'm not really sure, but that's what they got. Elite FSM. Um, it was a stupid trophy, you know, like glued with like God knows what, yeah. made of uh, cheap plastic, <laughs> and uh, and they brought it here, they brought it back here, and I and I and I held it, and I was like, wow, this is great. But I knew they were false, uh, uh, falsely reporting such stats. Stats. I'll give you one. I'll, I'll explain how they got the ten thousand people. Yeah. We have some public schools here, um, and one of the largest school holds about two and a half, two point five thousand students, a uh, morning and, and afternoon uh, uh, schools. Mm -hmm. And he came to one, and then the other, and that added, that added up to about five thousand students. And then when they went to another school, and that added up another five thousand students. Oh, That's so about ten thousand students. What did they do? They they printed a survey, and they gave it to a, a and they gave this survey to the principal. The principal was in charge of passing it on to the students. They quickly filled it like yes, no, yes, no. I like it. I don't like it. Blah blah blah. And that's it. Disseminate, disseminated. Now yeah, that's interesting. Students. So you can actually use audience size, and, and see in, in in the Tom Cruise video you mentioned, uh, we call it the the leaked go to guns video. <laughs> because he says, I want to go to guns on psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. And that's a term fighter pilots use when they switch to guns rather than missiles on fighter pilots. Go to guns? Yeah, go to guns. Because an American fighter pilot, well, any fighter pilot can use missiles or guns. Yeah. If they're, so a so, dog fight, go to guns? Yeah, go to guns. You're, you're too close to get a missile lock, whatever. But anyway, um, that video opens with Tom Cruise. They give us some ridiculous number like... You know, Jeff Pomerantz. One billion people, I know, yeah. I remember. This, like, yeah, has reached one over point. one billion people. Yeah, yeah I know. So, Ridiculous. But now that you just explain, if you can Exactly count, the same process. Everyone you know, like, is it? Like, TC yeah. would just get on get on a camera and say, like, oh, you know, uh, it's a beautiful religion. Boom. Two billion people more disseminating onto the range. But also, if you wanted to count uh, anyone who's watched his films, I guess, because see, Scientology... Uh, has a lot of different nonsensical ways of creating statistics that don't exist. Mm -hmm. And we like, like, like some, you see these orgs, uh, I'm sorry, the videos that David Miscavige puts out, they have these nonsense statistics like 200%, you know, you know yeah. Well, no, they made a claim that they, Scientology has made the claim that they reduced crime in Colombia by 50%. 70%, I know. I'm sorry, know. I'm sorry, yeah, 70%. Yes. Now, never mind that Colombian army and the U.S. DEA, I mean, never mind that $10 billion was spent taking down drug cartels and that mm -hmm. Col Colombia had to negotiate with FARC. Correct. And so much more went on that Scientology had exactly nothing to do with. Nothing to do with it. I and yet, yet here, I look at the ridiculous... Uh, I don't know how you say bullshit in Spanish, um, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's exactly you. what it is. How do you say it in Spanish? Uh, uh, we don't use a strong uh, word no. for that. We, we, we call it pura paja. Just like, that's just hay, you know, like what you feed horses. Pure <laughs> hay. That's what we call it when pura paja, like, or, or, or just, it's all shit, we call it. It's yeah. pura mierda, like, just like that, but... Yeah, but well, let me give you let me give you an interesting uh, 
piece of information about the, uh, the uh, um, bringing about peace in Colombia. Two years ago, October 2016, uh, there was a nationwide referendum. It was, you just had to vote yes or no. That's it. Do you want the peace process to go on? Yes. Do you want the peace process to go on? No. Do you know what happened? Well, wasn't the first vote no? Correct. It 51%. failed. 51%. And people 51%. were stunned, stunned that it failed. Exactly. Uh, us, right here, uh, Colombian citizens, we decided to say no to the peace process. Do you know what the Scientologists here in New York uh, uh, posted on Facebook? What? To vote no. Really? They actually got yeah. involved in politics? It, well, they didn't get involved, but like at, at the time when I used to have like a few contacts from the York because I had to like delete them or block them. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, but they, they were opposed to the peace process? 100%. Why 500%. Was, why did they, why were they opposed? Um, here in Colombia, there's a president who's really popular, or ex-president, his name is Alvaro Uribe. He is, I, I can't tell you how many bad things he, he represents or he is, but he opposed the, the uh, peace process because of many serious things that, you know, like if were brought to light, would just incarcerate him, in, in, I'm sorry, incarcerated, incarcerate Yes. Him immediately. In, so you opposed it. Yeah. yeah, implicate him. Yeah, absolutely. A lot. And especially because part of the peace process would create a court that would just bring uh, businessmen, police, uh, guerrilla, paramilitary, and military to talk and just, you know, reveal what they did. Mm. And it would implicate him deeply that he, you know, just promoted massacres and stuff. Like, we're speculating because he's not really proven. But it's easy to to uh, um, oh, so you're you're talking par that. partly about the what's called the extra ju extra judicial murder killings, yeah, yes. exactly, and many yes. more things like massacres and stuff, Very including dog, drug dealing and th this guy's bad news. But he appeals to he appeals to about 30, 40 percent of the uh, of the uh, uh, voters here. Uh, people love him. People love him with passion, and Scientologists uh, are, are no difference. So, what, 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 what did Scientology, what, when the peace process was approved? Mm -hmm. uh, is that the second vote? It wasn't. There was there was no second vote. There was mm -hmm. only one vote, and then the president had to take uh, matters into his own hands and approve it on uh, approve it on his own. So that so they, they decided to go forward with the peace process with FARC. Mm -hmm. Is is this when Scientology claims to reduce? They Scientology is claimed, they did it before and after. Oh really? Before and after, yeah, because the thing had been done. Uh, the killings and the violence had been down training for two years prior to the uh, referendum. Now, uh, on what basis possibly could Scientology claim to have reduced crime by seventy percent? This is completely a false report. But they wouldn't know that. That's, this, is the, this is the story they're sold. Listen, when I was in, when I was in, I don't remember when um, or how I got this piece of information that if Hubbard hadn't existed, World War III, uh, would have, the war would have been waged before 1991 when I, when I became a Scientologist. That, that's the idea that I got, that, that if, if he hadn't, you know, started already, like, creating a better environment in, uh, all around the world, we would have had World War Three years before. You know, that he was an influential factor so as to stop world uh, war, sorry, uh, everywhere. That's, that's what I, that's what I, that's the idea that I got when I was only 17, 20. Yeah, that you're, that, that L. Ron Hubbard prevented Armageddon. And, uh, yeah, yeah, Armageddon. yeah, 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 exactly. That's that's how I got it, and, and somebody said it, and I just bought it. I didn't I didn't ask. I didn't I didn't I didn't study. I didn't do any research. I didn't watch History Channel. I, I, I didn't do anything. I just I just bought I just bought it hook hook like it. Sorry, hook line and sinker, all the way. We well, you know it's interesting just by way of comparing our cultures. 
you know, I was born in, in, in the late 1950s. Mm-hmm. So when I was in kindergarten uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, this was the closest the the world came to an th- actual nuclear war. True. Uh, I, I remember the sheer terror of uh, the, the the United States had twenty thousand nuclear missiles or more, and Russia had twenty thousand nuclear missiles. Right. And if there had been a nuclear exchange, it, it, it would have been, been game over. Well, when you're when you're five years old and you think the world can end any time, right? It has an effect on you. And and the U.S. government's answer after President Kennedy and, and Mr. Khrushchev resolved the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm-hmm. and and later we learned that the President Kennedy agreed to take missiles out of Turkey. Uh, there were a lot of things secrets about it, but after that was resolved, the the U.S. military said we need more money to spend on defense. Right. And so there was in the United States, L. Ron Hubbard, going back to 1950, when he launched book one, Dianetics, <clears throat> there was already the fear of nuclear war in the United States. And mm-hmm. L. Ron Hubbard knew how to play to that emotion of Americans. I know. And, and people. I know. If you read his policies, it's all about <clears throat> communism and stuff. Yeah. Well, he's saying that this is we're the only group standing between mm-hmm. nuclear annihilation and peace. Yep. And so that's when you live through it and it's real, like I growing up, yeah, that, that kind of thing, like, yeah, let's try to do anything to prevent nuclear proliferation, and nuclear war. But mm-hmm. if the, the whole idea in Scientology that L. Ron Hubbard himself personally was the reason there was no thermonuclear war. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how I got it. That's how I got it. You know, 1991 was only two years after the, uh, the, 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 the wall was taken down. True. Mm-hmm. True, and and so you feel like I have to devote my life to this technology that that can, that can clear the planet. Somewhat, Jeffrey. Somewhat. I never somewhat. bought the whole story. I, I can say that to my pride. I, I never bought the whole story. I, I never saw anybody levitating or coming back from like I died two years ago, and this is my bank account, and this is my name. I ne- I never bought it. I never saw anybody like, you know. I ooh, look. I took I took my glasses off because I be, I wasn't clear. <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, like. To my sure. credit, I went like ninety five percent, but no, not a hundred. Yeah, the, I think most Scientologists, if they were honest, they would admit they've gone less than a hundred percent. Yeah, um, and it is funny when you see pictures um, from Flag Land Base of the the OT eights uh, graduating. You know, holding oh my up their god, cer- a lot of them have Coke bottle glasses, real thick glasses. Mm-hmm. And and I, so Hubbard's claim that you don't need glasses, that went out the window a long time ago. But okay, I'm going to tell you a little story now that you bring up the OTA thing. It's just, I can't help it. Please. Just about a week ago, about a week ago, two weeks ago, one of my contacts on Facebook, she went OTA. This girl, I met her at the LA org. She's from Venezuela. She moved there. There was no crisis back in the day. This is 2003, 2004, I don't remember. She was aggressive. She wanted to marry someone. She was already OT5. She, she wanted to marry someone and get a green card. She did it. She got a green card immediately, but she had a daughter. Real cute girl. 10, 11, I don't know. See. And she abandoned her girl. She just really? sent her back to, to Venezuela. And, and as far as I know, last I saw her on Facebook, she was like uh, uh, taking her clothes off. I, I, I don't know what, is she, what she's doing, but she... This, this girl, she abandoned her girl. And just now, a couple of weeks ago, she's proud holding that certificate. I just can't think of the, 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 the poor little girl who was abandoned by her mother. Yeah, she left her all is, devices when she was only uh, 12, 13. I don't remember. Place, yeah, in a place like Venezuela. Th- that story uh, of uh, Scientology parents being so selfish that they mm-hmm. want to pursue the ot levels that they will mm-hmm. aban- they will abandon mm-hmm. their children mm-hmm. that happens all There's, the time they say i'm not going to let a child and 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 this partly goes to because scientologists consider children to just be uh adults in tiny bodies mm-hmm. and so what is it to abandon them? they're on their own mm-hmm. and that's horrible they can fend for themselves it shows that this OT8 in particular has no ethics whatsoever as a parent, Mm-mm. no regard nope. for a child. Uh, 
So abandoning their child. Some Scientology parents abandon their children to a, a fate that's very horrible, and that's they give them to the Sea Org. That's what they do. And they they want they want they want to grow and be old enough just to like, you know, just sign the contract over there and just, you know, just leave home, and leave me alone. I don't want you. Just go join the Sea Org. Yeah, I, uh, I I've been on my own since I was 18. I left home at 18, and uh, I would rather, as a young person, just take my fate into my own hands out there in the world rather than in Scientology. I think absolutely the the, the 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 children the people i've interviewed who were children in the cadet org are just nightmare heartbreaking stories of the things mm -hmm. they do inside of scientology mm -hmm. and that does include and that does include being sexually abused there they are, break you they break are, you they easily break you this is the thing there are sexual predators in the sea org right now to be clear i'm not saying that everyone in the sea org is like that i'm saying there's a very small percentage of people in the Sea Org who are sexual predators, mm -hmm. who take advantage of very young children in the Sea Org. That's right. And, and this this horror story is coming out, but that's what happens, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, so for an OT parent to abandon their child, they could be abandoning them to a sexual predator. They don't know. They don't care. No, they don't care. They don't want to know. Because they want to be an OT8. The, the more they know, the, the more they have to take responsibility and go back and, you know, if they want to make it to OT, but if they don't know, you know, they're good to go. Sure. And, and that's where you say in America, ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Yeah. Now, switching, switching topics, I was very fascinated to read that you, what you came to Los Angeles mm -hmm. and you went to the HGB. Yeah. To take magistrate training. That's what they told me, yeah. Now, please tell our listeners, what is the HGB and what is magistrate training? Harbor Guarantee Building is located on uh, Hollywood Boulevard and Ivor. And Ivor, am I saying it right? Yeah, Ivor. Yes, yeah, Ivor. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, real close to that, to that street. 12-story um, building. Uh, it used to be a bank. And on the second floor, there's the Charles Chaplin office. Okay, the trust chaplain office. Charles, Char, Char, Charlie Chaplin, oh, you know. Oh, the, the, oh I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, actor. the Charles, Charlie Chaplin's old. Yeah, office. you okay. know, like like when I was when I had when I was fresh in, in in Scientology, I met this guy who had done some training there, and he told me about the office, and I was like, wow, I want to see that office. I want to see that office, and oh yeah, yeah, it's in this building. So I I made it a point that I wanted to go there. And you know somehow I, I I actually ended up going to that building. But the funny thing is that I wanted to see the office, Char Charlie Chaplin's office. Sure. And so I was like, when I when I went, it's 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 exactly on the same floor where I was studying. So when I went there, I was like, I, I was more interested in the office than, than 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 anything else. So I was like, where is it? What is it? What is it? They showed it to me, you know, as part of my intro thing, and I ended up cleaning it for an, a year and a half. Isn't that stupid? <laughs> I no, ended up cleaning it, sweeping, not sweeping, it, vacuuming it every Saturday night. Well, the magistrate program, <laughs> the magistrate program, this is the, the uh, class eight of ethics. That's how they sold it to me. Wow. Uh, it consisted of be becoming a class four auditor um, and a rollback auditor, basically. That was, that was the program. And uh, it was, it was um, at the time, the, um, what you might call it, um, not the PTSSP course, but I, I, one higher than that. Ethics okay. specialist course had just been developed or released, uh, whichever you want to, whichever way you want to call it. Uh, sure. It was a thick book. You know, it was the new thing, you know, like how to become an ethics specialist. I did it and I was like, ooh, I'm an ethics specialist. An ethics specialist. L yeah. Let me go back for, let me go back for uh, a minute, Adrian. Now, yeah. you, me you mentioned rollback. And I will mm -hmm. explore this because for for our new Scientology watchers, a rollback in Scientology is not a good thing. And mm -mm. here, here I'll, I'll set it up and then I'll let you take it. Here's how it goes. Okay, let's say I'm a public Scientologist. Mm -hmm. And I say, I heard that David Miscavige beats his staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, my fellow Scientologist, Joe, writes a knowledge report on me. Mm -hmm. Now, 
a rollback, your job, you step in, you want to tell what happens next. You call me in and you have yeah, a well, there's, report. There's okay, this what small, happens? There's this small confidential package where they teach you how to do that. And they had the uh, simulator. And so I saw it. I saw it a few times when they were drilling it. So it's basically just like, um, I'm not a tech trained auditor. So what I, whatever I'm saying is not accurate, but uh, basically they, they would just drag you in, uh, give you the cans, you know, trap you to the seat, to the seat and, and make you spill the beans by like saying like, okay, so you, you said that, what did you hear that? And said, so, so we well, just, let's, he let's, just let's, let's role play this for a minute. Okay, now let's see if we can. So, so Jeff, okay, so, what yeah. is it you were saying? And you would be saying like, I heard that. What, what was it you said? Okay, uh, what was it you I, said? I, I heard that David Miscavige beats his staff. Who told you that David Miscavige is beating his staff? And then you would say like, okay, it was Karen. And then I would drag Karen uh, and and you know strap her to a chair and you know hook her to the cans and then ask her the same question like. What, what 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 did you say that who's who who told you that and then she would say like you know it was it was you know Joe Smoke uh, Joe Smoke and and yeah. then I would just bring the next guy until I found uh, whoever started the whole rumor. So the rollback, you want to find the person who's originating what's called the black PR. Or black PR, yeah, that's right. That's what and they're then, doing. Okay, okay. Now let's say that we 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 go through all these people and we find out that. My friend Pete Griffith started it. What That's happens right. to the guy? What happens to Pete who actually started it? I I, I can't answer that question, uh, Jeffrey. I, I I don't know. Would he be declared or? I I guess he take... would just be subject to to the uh, normal procedure. But I I really don't know. I I never did the yeah. course. But the point is, Scientology for people who want to know what goes on internally. Oh, there, there that... will be consequences, and 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 yeah. we we already know that 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 whatever. Uh, procedure, procedure was established is always uh, followed in different ways according to who it is being applied on and and you know if, if you're if you if you got money uh, you know we'll just threaten you a little bit and if you pay enough you'll be let off the hook and if you're just a normal uh, citizen then you'll be uh, given the full force of justice so to speak but yeah, it's well, it's always horrible, and there's always threats and conditions, and you know, uh, you have to pay donations and clean the bathrooms with your tongue and whatnot. Now here, thank you. That's this is interesting. Now I'm going to add some <laughs> some comments on it. Yeah. The the rollback, the rollback in non Scientology terms is damage control. Damage control. We can call it that. Yeah. Black yeah. You're PR. going you're you're going to try to find out everyone who's heard the rumor mm -hmm. and then you're going to find out the source of the rumor mm -hmm. now now in scientology they have very harsh ethics penalties right, translated, yeah, that's right. tr translated that means you have to pay a lot of money that's right to, to clean what they call clean this up in ethics get your or ethics make amends in. yeah or to make amends for the damage you've done mm -hmm. to the group mm -hmm. so the bottom line is scientology is going to get a lot of money out of you and this is why Scientologists don't want to hear it. Exactly. Because, because the more they gonna, know, the more they're going to have to pay. It's going to cost them money. It's it, going to cost them money, a lot of money. In, in fact, I'm going to, uh, something I've shared on the Scientology Money Project on my blog, the reason OTs don't want to talk about Xenu or anything related to OT levels, they sign a bond where they have to pay $100,000 for each breach of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So it's not that an OT doesn't want to talk about it per se. It's that there's severe financial penalties for them doing so. Not only that, they could face expulsion from their church and being declared mm -hmm. a suppressive person. Mm -hmm. so, so you as a magistrate are part of that ethics machine that grinds people down. That's right. Now, did you do rollbacks? Did you did you serve as a magistrate? I, I never became an auditor, uh, and I never did the course. Yeah, you just did, didn't finish it. Now, I just sat there thanks to guys that were doing it, and you know, I I got to like see it a little bit. Now, as I understand, part of what led to you not finishing it was romance. Is that a rumor or is it true? It's it's if you say romance, it would be rumor. I just had a crush <laughs> on a girl.
<laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah. You had a you had a, you had a crush. <laughs> Nothing on ever a girl. happened. I didn't lay a finger on her, but I was I, I was like I had a severe crush on this girl from San Diego. So she was such a great girl, and uh, I just uh, you know I just you know when it came out it came out in uh, one of the uh, uh, sex check sessions, uh, <laughs> the uh, LRH host. You know they 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 gave me a fitness porn, and then, because I was a slow student. Well, and, you know, what's, uh, what's wrong with you having a crush on a, on a girl? That's normal. Well, it, I was on a, on a Sea Org base. You can't have anything like that. Oh, really? You cannot have a crush on somebody? No. This is our ethics. She belongs to How a different did... org. Uh, wait a minute. You're you going to have to help, help me out here. I'm not I, I, you. If, you, if you're an outer or, outer or trainee at the right. HGB at the time, I guess the same goes to uh, anyone who's a flag. You cannot have any uh, relationships or start anything with someone from a different or because this is gonna, you know, like this 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 person might not go back to their, to their org and stay with you, right? Oh, so, I see. So yeah, you're basically under 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 the same uh, uh, rules and guidance by uh, as the any of the any of the other C-Org members. You know, this is interesting because it's kind of a caste system. Mm-hmm. So an outer org trainee is like the lowest of the low. Mm-hmm. In, in, in the Scientology system, outer org means you come from another org and your org's paying for you to get training. No, yeah, but, supposedly. But, I, had but, to, I had to do a lot of cleaning and, yeah, dishwashing. Well, yeah, yeah, outer org trainees have to pay their way if their org doesn't have the money. Yeah, that was so a little surprise. Is, so this is why you're cleaning Charlie Chaplin's office every Saturday. No, night every, about, everybody no. had to uh, white glove on Saturday night. But uh, throughout the throughout the week, I had to go to the galley uh, on the sixth or fifth floor. I remember and do about two hours of kitchen work, um, setting tables, bussing tables, uh, uh, dishwashing. Um, I don't know. It was horrible. I'm, and the HGB, the tenth and eleventh floors, are the office Osa. of special affairs. Yeah, I went Osa. there once. Yeah. Now, what are those offices like when you go up? To I Osa? I only stepped off the elevator and I was on uh, on the uh, counter of the reception and there was a door and I think it was a wooden uh, panel and I saw nothing else. Yeah, but being in that atmosphere, the same building as the office of special affairs, did you oh, ever see? powerful. Oh, did you ever see all the big executives with all their? Not very many. I ran into um, Diana Hubbard once, and I knew that Cob was on the building, but I didn't see him. I knew that Gilam uh, Ed in Gilam Leserv. I, I, I don't know if I'm saying yes. his name right. Sure. He was on uh, in the building, but I, I never saw him. No, I didn't see him. And this was in the '90s. Yeah, I, I, I would get locked on the second floor, and then the other guys would go to a uh, staff meeting on the fifth or sixth floor and they would set up the hall to have the conference with uh, the meeting with those execs. But I know I never got to see him, any of them, any of them. Well, you would have been a, m- much lower on the hierarchy. Yeah. Now, when you left, when because you had a crush on a girl mm-hmm. who from San Diego, and mm-hmm. uh, so they basically, they basically... Uh, they sent me home. I mean... You know, to the L.A. York area. Well, no, when you left the HGB, where did they send you to? Back to Columbia or just... No, I, my org was L.A. Day. Oh, L.A. Day. Okay, mm-hmm. and you, you, were, you were there from 1998 to 2005. What was your post at L.A. Day? Uh, first, I started working uh, as the uh, CS, uh, senior CS assistant, and then I was a Div 6 course uh, supervisor. Now, senior CS means case supervisor. Senior CS, yeah, case supervisor. I was just her, her, her little page, her little bitch, just running around uh, doing her admin stuff. Like, you know, she had a lot of programs to, to do, like pictures, papers, copies, uh, meetings. I did that for her. Okay, so, and then and then you go to Div 6, which is, what's a good word for it? Sales? Sales. Uh, the front so, door, uh, okay. the, the beginner class, yeah. So when you're working at LA Day, uh, that that's uh, that's the building L. Ron Hubbard Way, Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. From 1989 you're, until 2005. Five. Yeah, we're calling it, it. That's what we call Big Blue. Big By the way, Blue. Karen, Karen and I live, uh, you know, really five minutes from there. Let's feel five minutes. Five minutes. Yes. Yeah, see, from 
uh, Celebrity Center. So I often, on my way home from, from running errands to my bank, especially, I'll go down L. Ron Hubbard Way just to check out the state of affairs <laughs> because, because it's a public street, right? Yeah, last I was there, it was so funny. It, it felt so strange. Like, I didn't know anybody else is strange. They're like, it's funny. Now, did you, did you have birthing there at Big Blue? No, I lived about a block away from 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 the uh, from the building. Oh, one of the apartment buildings they own. Mm-hmm. Were your birthings very nice, or were they? You know, that's the funny thing about being a Scientologist. You know, like when you see the parking lot, the carpool is poor. You don't see Lexuses or or or, or Mercedes or BMWs, which is like not so expensive, but you hardly see any of those nice cars. You know. True. So no, my, my life was really poor there. I had a small room, a very rundown place, cheap food. Luckily, I, I did some work over the weekend, so I had some extra little money to, to like feed myself and send send some home. But no, it was you know I had a cheap ass car. It was really poor, very it bad. Sounds ver- it sounds very depressing. Depressing is not the word. You got to create a better one. A, m- a more darker, yeah. like, uh, end of the world. End of the world, yeah. Give up all hope. Give up all hope. Get, you know, get the news ready. I know. But you were not in the Sea Org. You were staff. <laughs> no, I wanted to join the Sea Org before I joined staff. That's what I wanted to do. I thought I felt qualified to, to join the CMO in and then make it to end. <laughs> this is what I wanted wow. to do in the beginning. I wanted to go and work with David Niscavich at RTC. This, that's what I wanted to do in the beginning. Well, sure. That that if if you didn't know better, you would think yeah. you would be the the yeah. elite of the elite. Yeah, absolutely. Work, work, I wanted to be at the top. Yeah. Uh, were you were you able to join the Sea Org? I I never did. I never came close. When you're at the HGB or then when you're on um, at the base, uh, you're untouchable. Uh, recruiters never go anywhere near you. Oh, so the Sea Org recruiters are you're you're off limits. Absolutely. It's, so that was your karma is so good. You, if you're looking at it now, your karma was so good you were off limits to Sierra recruiters because can you believe normally, that? Oh, normally Sierra recruiters are vultures who show up at vultures. schools. Yeah, they show up. I, they show up at schools after 13, 12, and thirteen year old kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was. Um, uh, are you familiar with Mary uh, Mary Shuttleworth? I, I forget her name. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Doctor Mary Shuttleworth. Yeah, uh, it's, Doctor. It's very, well, that's what title she uses. Oh, use really? for human right. Use yeah, for yeah, human yeah, rights. yeah. She's across yeah, the street. Yeah. She she owns a, a, a little school. Yeah. Well, all those little kids, they would go to the org and and study with me in, in the afternoons, like three to six, and recruiters would be outside waiting for those kids all the time. Oh, God, that is terrifying. Yeah, and they got like... most of them, many of them. The funny thing is that they would join and then they would be out in uh, less than a year. Yeah, see here I'm looking at Dr. Mary Shuttleworth, founder and president, Youth for Human Rights International. Youth for Human Rights, yeah. Yeah, Youth for Human Rights is a uh, is another front group for, mm-hmm. for Scientology. Which incidentally was created by a non or member and not under uh, Ms. Cavage's uh, supervision or I don't I don't think she did it. I think she did it on her own with her son, who's like a camera guy or some movie guy. I don't know. Well, that wouldn't be unusual. Criminon was started by a, uh, a an actually a drug addict who had served time in prison, and it was yeah. taken over by 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 L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, or the study tech. <laughs> well, well, basically, if something is good and Scientology can take it, they will. They wouldn't hesitate. No. Hubbard actually issued a policy in the 1950s where he said, "I don't care who wrote it; it's copyrighted in my name." Ultimately, you finish out your contract in 2005. Is that when you go back home to Columbia? No, I hung around for no. for a few more years and I did some clerical work and and then I was done. I I ended up a relationship and then I moved uh, to the East Coast and I spent a few months there and then I decided to come back home. Now, were you still a Scientologist when you came home? I never was in the beginning. Like it was back in 2003 when I actually gave up. One of the things that really? uh, 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 got me off the HGB is because I couldn't make progress with my TRs or my uh, metering course. When I took the metering course back to the LA org, I tried, and they sent me back to the student head, the, the TRs course, and then back onto the metering course, and I couldn't make it. I gave up. Hmm. 
I give up. Yeah. This is 2003. Last time I was seriously in the course room. So uh, um, fast forward a few years later, I got the uh, basics. I didn't, I, I didn't even read them. When I came home, I had nothing better to do, and I was close to yours, so I went and I did the, uh, a few of the basics. And then I got married, and I just completely abandoned the whole subject until I heard your po podcast. Really? That's how it happened. I didn't like it. I wasn't with it. I, I was like, this is off. You don't make money. I hate it. I, I wasted my time, but I wasn't really like aware of what I had been a part of until I ran into your podcast. I was just playing with my phone and I was ch checking podcasts to see what I could listen to. When I, I saw Survivor, I said, what? Then I started listening to, my, to uh, uh, the Headleys and Mike Rinder, Rinder who, who I knew. You know, he's, he's a big guy. Yeah. You know, he, he, he was sure. big back in the day. So I listened to him and I listened to Mark. Mark Headley is the one I, I dig the most. Oh, he's amazing. He, he is, is funny. He's got every story. I don't miss uh, any of his podcasts or, or, or shows or with you or with uh, Aaron Smith or, or with Chris. It's, he's hilarious. And, and, of course, I read his book. It was one of the first things I did. And he was un believable then when i picked up uh Bareface messiah i was like unbelievable i'll tell you adrian part of the joy of doing podcasts when you just share yourself and you reach out to people it's amazing there's a big audience out there and you never know who's listening to you that's right so so it's delightful for me to, to hear that you a, a man in columbia listened to my my podcast yeah that's and right well, my first interview was Mike Rinder. Mike Rinder is such a generous spirit. He really gives. I said, Mike, I want to start a podcast. Will you be my first guest? He said, sure. Rinder is funny. He's he's great. He's got so much knowledge. Oh, he's a phenomenal, he's a wealth phenomenal of information. man. And he's a survivor. Mm -hmm. He is a survivor because the Church of Scientology and David Miscavige threw everything at him. Mm -hmm. Same with Mark and Claire Headley. Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember uh, before Mark, when Mark was blown for good and nobody knew who he was, posting on Zenu.net. Mm -hmm. And he posted the stories of musical chairs, I think, in 2006. And it blew me away. And then I, I, I uh, reached out to him. I met him for, uh, we had lunch in, in Burbank. And he told me the story of musical chairs. Oh, man. And, and, and the, one of Mark's great talents, he's a, he's a natural born storyteller in America. The, the best. A, oh, we have a word called a raconteur. Your story of what goes on, what they do to a young man with your idealism, your initial wins, and then you get more into the machine and it becomes worse than depressing. Mm -hmm. so, so that in 2003, you actually give up and all you're left to do is to just go through the motions. Mm hmm and I wrapped and, up my, my, my contract. I, I, I really had the idea that I couldn't break a contract. Many if somebody had just told me, like, yes, you can walk out. There's no I penalty. Would've. I would have. But nobody yeah. told me. Oh, so that was two years of your life. Yeah. Uh, treading, treading water and living mm -hmm. in their substandard. What was, uh, just a question. When you, were, when you were at LA Day, what was the worst thing that happened? Nothing, uh, um, uh, Jeffrey. Nothing, it was it was terrible. it was pretty laid back. Um, what was the worst thing? I had a comef towards the end of my contract, um, really? and it's a funny thing. It's a funny thing because this is this, this is when with the the FBO and the DFBO for more like the finance people they they had it in for me for some reason, but I didn't because I was keeping on the uh, uh, afternoon meetings uh, after lunch. I'm a very slow eater, and I was the deep six soup. And when you're the deep six soup, you can't go to the bathroom. Yeah, you can't. You can't like take extended breaks like everybody else does. They, they can just head down to a canteen. I couldn't. I was trapped in the course room for five hours straight. So I oh. took my time having lunch. So I just, you know, gave him the finger with, you know, in regards yeah. to the uh, the uh, sure. the uh, twelve thirty meeting, and I had my lunch. And and they decided to give me a comment exactly at the point when I was. I was having like my biggest, greatest, highest stats. Wow. Yeah. You're not supposed to punish an upstat. No, I was, you know how it rolls. Yeah. What was the result of the comment? Did they? Nothing. They, they, uh, Nothing. um, it wasn't severe. It wasn't severe. Um, yeah. 
no, I had just been commended by the ED, so they took that into account, and um, I think it was just like uh, making up the damage or like you know making amends. It was really, it was really, it was nothing. Um, what was one of the worst things? I had an accident. <clears throat> I had a small accident. I I came home, and I, I came home and I had a tooth extraction, and on my way back on the plane, it, it became uh, a bigger issue. And when I got when I got to LA, this my my face started to swell, and I had mm. no assistance, no medical assistance, nobody took care of me. My fa my face swelled up like a balloon, like a football, like a baseball bat in my in my mouth, like not a baseball bat, a baseball in my mouth, and nobody took care of me. I didn't know how to go to a hospital. I had to. I didn't have a car at the time, and I had to um, go to Silmar, uh, which is just a 20-minute drive, but if you take the bus, it's a two-hour ride. So you went up to the county hospital where they... County were hospital, and, and I sat there for a whole night, and I had to wait, and uh, they, they, they took care of me, and they they drained it and, and, and I was better, but I had to wake up, uh, not wake up, I had to wait the night off and until the next morning, that morning to be able to take a bus back to post. You know, that's pretty shabby. You have a, a, a dental infection, which if you don't take care of those, they become life-threatening. Yeah, yeah. And so they send you to the county hospital up in Silmar by bus. Yes, and this is not the accident that I was referring to. That was like my medical condition. But at the same time, I, when I was like going through this pain, which was an easy thing to fix with just antibiotics, but nobody explained yeah. it to me. Nobody, you know, like, you're so stupid. I, I was in a car crash, and nothing happened, nothing bad happened, but I was a, a bit hurt. Nobody uh, looked after me. You're on your own. You're on your own. And I was just a block away from New York. They knew I had been in a car accident. Nothing. Like, they, they don't call you. They don't They don't take care of you. They don't visit, you know. I'm going to tell you a funny story. My mom uh, was on staff she, uh, a while back. And um, the doctor uh, told us she had to have her uh, reproductive organs uh, extracted. That means that yes. she had to have a, she had to have a whole opening through through her, uh, you know, uh, belly. A hysterectomy. Hysterectomy, yeah. That, in, there you go. English. Total abdominal, very, total complete. Very, very serious. Very serious. And at the time, she was she was with Scientology, not anymore. And I and I told her like, hey, you know, like nobody's gonna send anybody to give you some assists. We're about a, f a thirty minute drive from the York, and if traffic is back, it could be an hour, maybe longer. But nobody came to give her any assist six months she was in bed with her thing you know like with this big cut which was brutal thing that she had the operation done the surgery uh she went under she underwent surgery and that was a lucky thing to do but but nobody called nobody came and she was on staff she was part of the team and talking to just about, about five years back they don't give a shit no they don't and uh I'll tell you a story you may not know. Karen and I are dear friend uh, Janice Grady. Mm -hmm. She, with her sister Terry, was original CMO. Mm -hmm. They were they were the original CMO on the ship mm -hmm. with Mr. Hubbard. Now, Janice's mother Yvonne started the Celebrity Center. That's right. And it got into such incredible affluence on its stats and it was making so much money uh -huh. that Hubbard took it over. It was sort of an unofficial project, but it just, it skyrocketed. Yvonne became ill. Yvonne, well, she got, she had a brain tumor. Oh. And because she was working, you know, 21 hours a day, living on sugar, caffeine, mm -hmm just driving her body relentlessly and then they took away celebrity center from her because you always get an ethics trouble mm -hmm. but when she when she got really sick she was literally just put in a room and she, they promised terry and janice that somebody would take care of their mother because terrace terry and janice were cmo right mm -hmm. Exe executives mm -hmm. they promised 
that they would put their mother on a special dietary program and do everything else. But then nobody winds up taking care of the Divine. woman who started this. Mm -hmm. They didn't take care of her. And then uh, Annie Broker, of course, who, who was there in the last days of Harvard. Yeah, she was dying of lung cancer. They kept her at the base so she couldn't escape or blow. Mm -hmm. And then when, and then in the last weeks of her life, days of her life, they put her in sort of a hospice thing in, in the apartments. Next to um, the Bron um, Bronson. Yeah, yeah so center. what you're saying is true. Absolutely. In the Sea Org, if you get sick, there's nobody to take care of you. Nope. You don't get taken care of. No. Nope. In fact, the, the the what what was astounding to me, Adrian, is the um, International Justice Chief Mike Ellis. During the Rathbun lawsuit, he was supposed to fly to Texas for a deposition several years ago. Mm -hmm. Now this is the International Justice Chief. I, I remember. I remember him. I, yeah, okay. I used to see him okay. at the building. <laughs> no, well, you know, he he he. I don't know how he is now, but at the time he was obese yeah that doesn't say much for scientology that one of your executives like that well his doctor had to write a note saying he had heart problems and high blood pressure and couldn't travel on an airplane yeah and my question was why was nobody just on a humanitarian basis why was nobody giving this man the medical help he needed if he had a heart condition high blood pressure and he was obese why isn't scientology taking care of this man and it doesn't say much that he he's not in shape to even fly on an airplane. So it doesn't matter whether it's you, Ivan Jench, Ivan Gilliam Jench, or so many people they don't take care of when they're sick. And then when some people, when they get older, or they're going to represent a big medical expense, their fitness boarded out of the Sea Org and thrown out altogether. And the funny thing is, is, is it is part of the culture. Um, <laughs> I met Alex, uh, Karen's son, you know, for a few years, I met him, I talked to him, I thought he was charismatic, a great kid. And the reason he died is because nobody paid attention to to his condition, which, you yeah. know, would have been solved rather easily. But that's... Well, that's antibiotics. Yeah, if his, that's how it goes. You, you don't touch a pill, you know, and, and if it is regarding Mike Ellis, you know, like him going to a doctor and being off post for a few hours, hell no. They have they they rather have him dead than not on post. That's that's how it is. It's plain and simple. That is chilling, and it goes to what Aaron Hubbard wrote. We would rather have you dead than incapable. Absolutely. And that is so. When you really grasp what that means, is we're not going to waste any time or money mm -mm. on you. Mm -mm. You're and it's your problem. You pulled it in. You handle it. And you know the way it looks. If he's if he's got uh, uh, body problems. That's because his PTS. His PTS is downstat. But how can the international justice chief be PTS? Well, that's how it is. Adrian, <laughs> exactly. So nobody cares if you if you started to look d deeper into it and and actually try to find an answer that, to that question, you realize that Scientology doesn't work. <laughs> you you just did a slow fade out of Scientology. Slowly. Yeah. Yeah. And is your are you a family members in still? Uh, thank God, no, no one is in. Uh, with my uh, cousin departing uh, the uh, free winds just uh, about a year and a half ago, that was the last of them. So that's a happy ending that your family's out of Scientology. Yeah, yeah. You have people in Colombia who are working at Flag or working in Scientology in the United States or other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. People from Venezuela, from Latin America, from Mexico. It seems like Scientology exploits many people from Latin America. Yes. Um, when I was hired for LA Day, there had been a tour right here at the, at the, at the local org from the Celebrity Center, and they recruited people uh, to go to uh, CC. And they got so many people, about 30 or 40 or 50 people. I don't know how many they got, but they got tons of people. They weren't Scientologists, but they knew a little bit about Scientology. And enough to like you know like feed them the lie that they had been a part of the church for 22 years which is the minimum required required to go to the embassy and uh, ask for a visa and that's what they did and they got a whole bunch of people to go to cc 
When they tell you you're going to the celebrity center, they show you the pictures of the building. But it wasn't true. It was the manor. It was just mm. cleaning, kitchen, you know, mops, uh, uh, room service. All these people went there to L.A. and left immediately. Yeah, and that, I'm glad you mentioned this because obviously the celebrity center, the manor, is a beautiful old hotel. Mm-hmm. But if you're going there to be to to be a maid and make beds, they don't tell you that. Dishes? <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. They they think you're coming to Hollywood to work with movie stars and yeah. something glamorous. Exactly. And they do they do this to flag. And so this is how they exploit people from Eastern Europe. That's right. Latin America, Africa. It's just so appalling that that they would do this to people. So you're saying the Colombians whom they recruited under false pretenses, they all left almost immediately mm -hmm. that was this is what that was in 1998 yeah see this is what the colombian media needs to cover and i'm glad they're putting some attention on scientology oh I'm, and, I'm 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 so happy this is happening like i knew i knew and i was witness uh, to the beginning of this uh situation i don't know if you knew uh, if you know how it got started but it but it was because of a comedian who uh reached you know the mike's the mike Eller story ended in uh, 96 but then there was this uh guy who became a famous celebrity here he was a stand-up comedian his name is andres lopez yes. um he got the medal of war uh what do you call it the uh, freedom medal what uh the yeah, one in october yeah, yes the, yeah, yes medal of freedom medal yeah. of yeah valor and what yeah. whatnot he got the medal and he became a really rich and influential celebrity and he started promoting the uh, way to happiness and he reached uh, some politicians. He went to Congress. He did some um, funny presentations, and then he uh, brought people with the way to happiness and the T-shirt. The and then he reached uh, the police, and then that's how he uh, lieutenants or uh, mayors or captains or whatever that was at the time. And as he was um, uh, working the ladder, um, he became a more prominent. Uh, a police person and you know he was the one that went to the uh, ship and and then when that happened that's when uh, I guess miscarriage or Scientology in general um, got wind of the story and then they they took over the uh, uh, police program uh, and the free wins in Cartagena but it was be it was because these comedians started it all with the police that's interesting. Yeah, Andres Lopez, he's on uh, Scientology Network, Meet a Scientologist. Mm -hmm. His video published June 5, 2018, has 6,000 views. <laughs> now, would, is, is, he, uh, is he still actively promoting Scientology in Colombia? I think, I think he's not. When I, came, when I came back home, I saw one interview where he went to one of the... Uh, late night shows and he talked about the way to happiness once i saw him mm -hmm. talk about scientology on tv once i never saw him uh, talk about scientology ever again because we all know deep down that it is embarrassing we cannot talk about it openly because it doesn't make sense no and it has such a bad reputation yeah yeah it's you don't want to bad yeah. reputation you don't want to, you, you don't want that. When did you make the conscious decision that you were no longer a Scientologist? Was it 2003? Were you still in? No, uh, after the podcast. After the, after yeah. listening to my, my yeah. podcast. Yeah, I was like, and, what? Yeah. You, well, I'm glad I helped. Uh, oh, you did it all. Actually, and, I, and I'm glad that Mark Headley, no, I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> I'm glad that, that those of us who are working on, not just me, but obviously my wife Karen's video channel. Yeah. You know, like how some, some of what? us, some of us are just sometimes are part of the church and then like we, we, we step away from the church, but we like, yeah, I'm somewhat a Scientologist. Yeah. I've taken some courses, you know, like, mm -hmm. and we don't bad mouth it and we don't, uh, we don't have, we don't hold anything against it. And we're like, yeah, I don't talk about it. But after I read the books, now I, I, I feel more capable of like uh, explaining exactly how uh, the whole thing was created in the beginning with Hubbard and uh, Jack Parsons and his wives and his kids and Alexis Hubbard and Quentin and oh my God, those stories are horrific, horrific. They really are. And, and Andrew, I'd like to have you back on again. We could go through a part two. Anytime. And 
because I, well, what I'm fascinated as an American, I'm very fascinated with what's happening in Colombia and what the outcome will be in Colombia for Scientology. And I'm, I am researching it very intensely because Colombia, Colombia putting attention on Scientology is definitely something that I know is of a major concern to David Miscavige and the Office of Special Affairs. It is and now. It's on the newspaper. It's it's on comedy. It's on the websites. It, it, yeah, you, your wife were, was interviewed just yesterday. I heard the the, the, the show. Uh, it was it was it was good. It was good. And, and it was people on, are paying attention on. to it. And the funny thing is, again, there's no one that can talk on their behalf. No, they have no spokesman. No, they're too afraid to. Yeah. In fact, they have Scientology TV, so they have what's in called in Scientology a one-way flow. That means I talk, you listen, uh -huh. and and that's all they're willing to do is say we'll talk and you listen. Mm -hmm. No, that's not how it works, David Miscavige. Yeah. We're not curious. We're, exactly. The only thing I'm the only thing I'm curious about Scientology is why the IRS has not taken away its tax exemption here in America. That's it. Other other than that, I'm not curious about a damn thing. And the Columbia National Police being in bed with Scientology is something that needs to be investigated. I, I myself am outraged that the Los Angeles Police Department is in bed with the Church of Scientology. This has happened in the city of London. Mm -hmm. This has happened in other police agencies. They get in with their anti-drug literature and do safe pointing. And maybe that'll be the, the, the next topic we'll talk about on a future interview. What is happening? What do you think the outcome will be with the Colombian police? Do you think that the government will order the police to distance themselves from Scientology? Yeah. That they'll, that they'll, that they'll say, you know, you need to cut ties. We as a nation cannot be identified with this American cult. Oh, yeah. And do you think that's coming? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, that's good. Good. Then we'll leave, we'll, we'll leave it at there. Yeah. And I re really appreciate your time, Adrian. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.